Good morning, students, and welcome to school. We are in for a very, very exciting day because we're going to do a study on Polk County, the county that we live in. And I'd like to start out first by calling roll. Lauren, Molly, Jane, Lily, Alex, Taylor, Percy. Very good. Today, as I said, we're going to study the history of Polk County, but we're going to study it in a very unique way. We're going to study it by trying to understand three elements that made up our county. In fact, that made up Central Florida. They are the Seminole Indians, the cattlemen and that industry in town, and the railroad. And we're going to take each one and talk about them. And I know that you all have many, many questions that you want to ask about these different things. So we're going to do that one at a time. And I thought this morning, since everybody is bright, eyed, and chipper, that we would start with an understanding of the Seminole Indians. And we will learn about the Seminole Indians by you asking questions and then me trying to answer them for you. So if you are ready to begin, we shall begin on the Seminole Indians. Lauren? What is your question? Who are the Seminole people? The Seminoles of Florida call themselves the unconquered people. They are the ancestors of a few hundred Native Americans who eluded capture by the United States in the 19th century. Their Creek Indian ancestors for many generations migrated down the rivers and creeks of Alabama and Georgia. Then south into Florida, after the original inhabitants were gone, they eventually settled near present-day Gainesville by the 1740s. They were basically sedentary farmers, hunters, and cattlemen who survived in the Florida wilderness through understanding nature and learning to live off the land. They were called by the Spanish Seminales, a word thought to be derived from Semeron, meaning wild or runaway. By 1765, they were referred to as the Seminole in British documents. Jane, what is your question? Do the Seminole live in Polk County? For over 100 years, small bands of Native Americans traveled south and west across the land that one day would be Polk County to hunt in the Everglades and trade on the coasts of southwest Florida. Along these trails, they built seasonal camps. Over time, continuing competition with Europeans for land and food supplies, especially a decrease in the deer population from overhunting to collect hides, forced more Native American families further south into Florida. With the pressure of expansion of the growing population in the United States, a series of conflicts resulted in warfare in the southeast. Around 1812, some Seminole leaders had moved their families permanently south on Peace Creek near Fort Meade. Tennessee native General Andrew Jackson turned his army on Florida between 1817 and 1818. His troops burned crops, took cattle, and captured suspected runaway slaves. This became known as the first Seminole Indian War. Many Seminole families fled further south. There would be two more wars with the United States between 1835 and 1847 and 1855 to 1858. Among the leaders of these war refugees was Chief Ohani. He settled west of Lake Hancock, becoming so prosperous that a visitor marveled at his homestead. In all respects, the place resembled the residence of a substantial planter. By 1823, the settlement was home to over 100 people. Chief Chipko was another familiar figure in the history of folk. His family survived decades of conflict to establish a peaceful agrarian life with his band just south of Lake Pierce or Catfish Lake. Although Chipko fought in the Second Seminole War, he did not participate in the Third. During the wars to remove the Seminole from Florida, the United States Army built roads and forts across Polk. 
future President Zachary Taylor built Fort Fraser in Polk. Those Seminoles who were forced to move to Oklahoma stayed many months in Polk near this fort before boarding ships at Tampa for New Orleans. Many died on the trip. After the Seminole Wars, the few remaining Seminoles took shelter in the cypress swamps and hammocks of the Florida Everglades. For many years, the Seminole people stayed away from the Florida settlers. By the 1880s, however, the people ventured out of their camps and families traveled by ox cart or dugout canoe to visit traders who set up shop in the wilderness. Indians brought animal pelts, plumes of exotic birds such as the snowy egret and the roseate spoonbill, and alligator hides to trade for supplies, cotton cloth, garden produce, and colorful glass beads. The Seminoles formed friendships with traders and their families. Chief Chipko, however, explained that the Great Spirit had told him to die in the land that he loved, and he resisted all efforts to remove him. Beginning about 1872, he returned to the Kissimmee River Valley and lived briefly near Lake Wales, then present-day Haines City, before locating his band to the shores of Lake Hamilton. Before his death in 1881, Chipko's nephew, Tallahassee, became chief. Taylor, your question. How did the early Seminoles live? In this hot, humid environment, families set up camps on hammocks, the higher ground. Some built log cabins, some built chiquis, a style of thatched roof house. We know thatched roof architecture had been adopted as early as 1830. With wide open sides, chiquis were well suited to the climate. Creek men and women had distinct roles in their culture. Traditionally, Men were the hunters and warriors. Men spent increasingly more time and went greater distances to hunt deer or other animals providing furs or skins for trade. The women's role included gardening, weaving, basketry, pottery, and caring for the family. To be able to acquire desired trade goods, women busied themselves in the time-consuming task of dressing hides. They sewed clothing for their families by hand. Although the nuclear family was the primary social unit, the Seminoles retained the Creek tradition of close ties with their matrilineal clan relatives. Clans often determined household arrangements with settlements made up of women, all related, and of the same clan living in several houses built around a central square. Their husbands were from another clan. Clans continue to play a major role in seminal organization, living patterns, and culture in their matrilineal society. Totemic clans are known by names that reaffirm the people's belief about their alliance with the first ancestors, such as panther, bird, and otter, or wind clan ties with the supernatural and are the basis of many myths and legends. Alex, what is your question? What was life like for the Seminole children? Like other children in Frontier, Florida, there was much work to be done helping the family with daily chores. Tribal elders shared storytelling, artwork, and music with the children. As the early Seminole moved from camp to camp, the kids would have few toys. Children, when there was free time, played quietly. They might have a small box that was exclusively theirs. It might hold a shell rattle, a small ball, or a favorite palmetto doll. The Seminole played ball games like stickball. The traditional ball game was played in varying versions by many southeastern tribes. The game has elements of a team sport but also involves the individual skill and endurance. It involved hitting a tall, slim pole with a hard tennis ball-sized ball that is thrown with a small tennis racket-like stick. The object of the game was to hit the opponent's goalpost by striking the ball with great force. Percy, your question. 
Are there any good books about Seminole Indians that you would recommend for me to read? Betty M. Jumper, Legends of the Seminole, Pineapple Press, 1994. Betty Jumper was born in 1923 near Lake Okeechobee in southern Florida. She graduated from a primary school in Carolina and went on to a Kiowa Indian Hospital in Oklahoma, where she became a nurse. She worked on the Seminole Reservation with the public health as a nurse. In 1967, she became the first woman to serve as chairman of the Seminole Tribal Council.